Hello, everybody. Um, as you know, with the uh, with the test yesterday, you ended the first course in this uh, in this subject, and you're starting a new one uh, today. How was the test? It depends on the variant, does it? Okay. Um, so, who, who thought it was easy? Just raise your hand if you thought it was easy. No, nobody wants to say that. Okay. Who thinks it was really difficult? Who thinks it was really, really difficult? Depends on how much you know. Well, that's how tests work, yes. <laughs> it does depend on how much you know. Uh, and who thought it was okay? So, what do, like, all the people think because you didn't raise your hand <laughs> to any option. So you know what to think. Fair enough, fair enough. But you should have some idea, right? Uh, it's okay, okay, okay. So at least for some people it was okay. Uh, that's good to hear. All right. Um, so the course we're starting today is going to be dealing mostly with metabolism. So we're going to be talking about how various substances are turned into other substances, how energy flows in, uh, in our cells. Uh, we're going to be talking about various ways how to transport energy and how to use it, um, etc, etc. Now today's lecture is sort of an introduction to the, to the whole thing. And we're going to be talking at a relatively abstract level. Okay, so we're not going to be talking about specifics, about what changes to what, but we're going, to, we're going to be talking about very abstract principles. And in fact, most of the stuff that we're going to be, that we're going to be talking to, uh, about today um, is part of uh, uh, a discipline called thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, which is part of physics or chemistry, uh, depending where, you, uh, where you're coming from. All right, the title of the lecture is What Powers our cells. Um, and if uh, somebody asks ask you that, or, or if you know you, your grandmother, anyone to explain to her what powers our cells or whatever, what would you, what would you think about? What, what, what would be the words that would come up in your head? What? Mitochondria is the powerhouse. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. I've never been quite clear what that actually means, but everybody keeps saying that. It's no white chalk here. All right, okay. Uh, but okay, mitochondria, yeah, good answer. Mitochondria, all right. Glucose. Glucose, good. Oxidation, all right. Oxidation is quite an interesting answer because with oxidation we always must have reduction. reduction. Okay, so we could put reduction there as well because if there's oxidation there must be reduction. There's no other way around it. But all right, oxidation, glucose, mitose. Sorry? Water? Does water power our cells? Sorry? No? Okay. Well, it might do, I don't know, but. ATP, sure. ATP. Sorry? ADP? ADP? Hmm. <laughs> some extent, to some extent. We'll, we'll get to that later in the course, I think, but yeah, maybe. Sorry, what did you say? Metabolism. Metabolism, generally, all right, sure. Metabolism. I'm not sure your grandmother would understand if you said metabolism, but actually, she probably wouldn't understand most of these words that are here, but... Sorry? Oxygen. Oxygen, sure. Oxygen is needed for a lot of the processes. Yeah. Energy. Energy, all right. Now we're getting to, uh, to very abstract concepts. Okay. Other ideas? Enzymes? Sure. Why not? Enzymes? Any other ideas? 
key is th thermodynamics. <laughs> well, thermodynamics is really the study of all those processes. So I'm not sure how that would power the whole thing, but, but all right. Um, all of these words that you mentioned are in some ways correct. Okay, so we could, we could take all of those to in certain meaning um, power ourselves, all right? And with most of them, we're gonna be dealing quite a lot more in a lot more detail later on in this course. But I, as I said, today I want to talk at very abstract level, so I'm gonna take the most abstract word out of all of these, and that's energy. Um, because all of the other ones have something to do with energy. Um, what is energy? What is it? Hmm. <laughs> What's the ability to do things? It's the ability to do things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry? Who said? All right. So the official definition of energy is the potential, the ability of a system to do work. Okay? Now, that doesn't explain probably a lot because there are still words that we don't quite understand or maybe not understand in a very specific thermodynamic way. One of them is system. What is a system? A certain area, place that you define. Very good. Okay, a system in physics and especially in thermodynamics is just a place, area, bit of space that we're interested in. So it can be anything. It can be a test tube, it could be a, a cell, or it could be a mitochondrion, it could be one enzyme, one protein molecule, it could be the whole planet, or the whole solar system, or whatever. Okay, they're all systems, and we just pick the one that we're interested in. Why is it important to define a system? Well, because if we have a system that we're measuring, that we're looking at, we also have the rest of the universe around it which we call, it is the environment, but in physics we call it the surroundings, all right? Okay, so we have the system, the bit that we're looking at, all the rest of it is the surroundings, okay? And those are words, those are ter that's a part of terminology that we're gonna be using today and maybe later on as well, all right? So, energy is the potential, the ability of a system to do work. Now, what is work? Okay, so in mechanics, okay, force time displacement, very good. Derivative uh, of the energy? Derivative, um, but you don't mean mathematically derivative of energy or? Yeah. You do mean mathematically. I think. Okay, derivative of energy? Yeah, I'm not sure it is. Uh, yeah? All right, okay, so I'll try to define it as clearly as possible. So going back to energy, we'll get to work in a second, okay? Going back to energy, energy is a potential to do work. Now, you know probably different kinds of energy. There's kinetic energy, okay? Kinetic energy is the energy of a moving body, okay? Good, what other types of energy are there? There's potential energy, okay? Potential meaning that it can be changed into a different kind of energy, for example, kinetic energy, typically. What other kinds of energy are there? There's heat, we'll get to heat, okay. Sorry? There's electric energy, okay, yeah. Some electric potential, okay, good. Okay, so it could be radiation, radiative energy, okay, good, in the form of light, good. There's mechanical energy, which is usually potential or kinetic, but sure, yeah, okay. Chemical, indeed, yes. We're talking about, you know, chemistry and, okay, so chemical energy, which is also some kind of potential energy, which is in the, um, in the chemical system, in the chemical composition of the system. All right, so different kinds of energy. Now, if we take any system, and as I said, it could be a test tube, it could be a cell, it could be a planet or whatever, we can, sum all those different kinds of energy of all the particles, of all the components of the system together and get a parameter which describes the system which is called the total internal energy or just internal energy. I'll erase this. So, 
U, that's, the, uh, that's how we abbreviate it, is internal energy. And internal energy of a system, as I said, is just the sum of all the different kinds of energies that are in the system. Chemical, potential, kinetic, what have you, okay? All of these energies, we sum them up. Now, this is one of the parameters that can describe a system, but honestly, it's actually very difficult to measure. And therefore, we usually just look at changes in internal energy. Okay, it's very difficult to take a test tube and measure all the energies of all the particles inside. Okay, there are some tricks that we can do to figure it out, but it's, it's not easy. So usually, we look at changes of internal energy. And you probably know this notation. What does it mean? Delta. Delta U, which means change in a parameter, delta U, change in internal energy. All right? Now, how can we change the energy, the internal energy of a system? What can we do? Okay, so one possibility is to add more energy to it. Or take some energy away. Very good. Sorry? Indeed. So we can add or take away energy from the system, and there are in thermodynamics only two possible ways how we can take away energy or give energy. One is work, okay? And the other one is heat. Okay, so W and Q, those are just the letters that we, did, that we used to denote work and heat. So both work and heat are not types of energy. No, they're not. They are just methods by which we can transfer energy. Okay, so there are just ways how we can transfer energy. They're not energies, so there's no heat energy, even though People use it, and sometimes you find it in books, but it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as heat energy, as there is no such thing as work energy, okay? Work and heat are just types of transferring energy from one system to another or within one system. Is this clear? Now, what is the difference? Why do we have two types of transfer of energy? What is the difference between work and heat? Potential versus uh, kinetic energy? Not really, no. It's not, I just said that it's not energy, okay? It's a type of transfer of energy. What's the difference between work and heat? Hmm? Sorry? It can either be absorbed by a system or be a screen. Sure, but work can also be done by the system or it can be done on the system and therefore the energy is absorbed. That's not really the difference. No, and I'll try to explain in a second why that is not the case. Yep. Yeah. Internal, external. Not really. I mean, work can be done externally or it can be done by the system on the surroundings. Okay? And heat can also be either absorbed from the surroundings or given off to the surroundings. So it's always a communication between the two. Yep. Uh, the difference between giving energy to the particles of the system versus to the entire system? It's all giving energy to the particles and to the entire system, okay? You can't really separate those two together, uh, for, uh, apart. The difference is that work, yes? Not really, no, okay. The difference is, yes? That you? Yeah, we said that's mechanical work, you can define it that way. But actually the distinction, let me, let me say that now, the distinction between work and heat is that work is an ordered transfer of energy. Okay, it's ordered. So for example, when I'm pushing the chalk here, I'm pushing all the particles in the chalk in the same direction. I'm doing work, okay? If I try to heat it up by applying flame or something like that, the particles will also, energy will also be transferred to all the particles, but it will be disordered. Each of the particles will be moving in a different direction. 
Okay? So the, the only difference between heat and work is that work is ordered. Okay? It doesn't have to be mechanical work. It can be electrical work, for example. So it could be an electric current flowing. It could be radiative work. So it could be, there could be light coming off. Okay? So there are different kinds of work, but it's all ordered. Okay? While heat is disordered. And that's the only difference. Okay? So once again, there are not different kinds of energy, but there are different kinds of transferring energy. Okay? Order or disorder. All right. Now, as you correctly said, the only way to increase or decrease the internal, internal energy of a system is by adding some energy or taking some energy away. Now, this, what I just said, is actually a formulation of one of the fundamental laws of physics, which is called, which is called the first law of thermodynamics. Okay? First law of thermodynamics, which says an isolated system, well, there are different formulations. One is, and the one that you probably know, but does anyone know a different name for the, for the first law of thermodynamics? No? There is a different name for the first law of thermodynamics, one that you may be actually more familiar with. Indeed, it's the law of conservation of energy. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay, so basically what it says is in an, isolated, in an isolated system, a system that cannot be given or release any energy, the energy stays the same. Okay, the only way we can change the energy, the internal energy of a system, is by giving or taking away energy, but no energy can be created and no energy can be destroyed. Okay, it can be transferred, but it cannot be created or destroyed. Okay, leaving the general theory of relativity aside, because there we know that we can change matter into energy, etc. But, but even there, the conservation works. All right? So first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of energy. And actually, the mathematical formulation of it is this, because it says that any change in the internal energy of a system means that if something changes here, it means that either the system is doing work or that work is being done on it, or that heat is released or absorbed, or energy as heat is released or absorbed. There's no other way, okay? If neither of those are there, if the, these two are zero, the change in internal energy is zero. Is this clear? Very important first law of thermodynamics. Good? Now, one thing as a, as a preparatory step for stuff that we're gonna be later on in the lecture, is the signs of these two quantities. So they are both positive, as you can see here. Work and heat are both positive. When they are positive, it means that the system is absorbing them. Okay? What would the signs be if the system was releasing them? They would be negative. All right? It makes sense. They have to be positive if the system is absorbing them in order for the internal energy to go up, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be going up, okay? So whenever we see a positive sign, it means that the, uh, that the, um, the system is absorbing it, okay? When it's releasing it, we have to add a negative sign, okay? And we'll use that later on, and I'll show it again where, why it's important. All right. So... This is the definition of the first law of thermodynamics and the definition of internal energy as such. Now, the energy as we defined it is a potential to do some work. And this is important for us because our body, our cells, our organelles, our muscles, all the organs are constantly doing some work. Okay? We wouldn't be alive if our body wasn't doing work. Okay? The work could be building protein molecules or DNA or transporting ions across the membrane. That's all work. Okay? And then, of course, there's the macroscopic work, the muscles moving stuff around. Okay? So our body is doing work. And therefore, we're interested in how that is possible. What processes have to happen from the point of view of thermodynamics for our body to be able to do work? Okay? And this is kind of what we're doing today just getting the basic principles around. Energy is the potential to do work. We need that. We need energy because 
transferring energy as work is just transfer of energy, so we need energy. However, the content of energy in a system, the amount of energy the system has, cannot on its own tell us how the energy is going to be transferred. Okay? And I'll show you an, a, an analogy, an illustration of why that is so. Yep? We'll, we'll get to that, and the difference is massive, okay? It's a, it's a completely different concept. We'll get, to, we'll get to that in a second, all right? So, now we know everything about energy, the potential, but we're now interested in what has to happen in order for the system to do work, okay? What conditions have to be met, basically, for the system to do work? Now, imagine that we have two blocks of some metal, let's say aluminium, on top of each other, okay? And the, the let's say they have uh, 20 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters, they're exactly identical, okay? Um, and the top one has temperature of 30 degrees Celsius and the bottom one has temperature zero degrees Celsius, all right? Otherwise, they're identical. Now, what will the internal energies look like? Which, which one is gonna be bigger? The top one, why is the top one going to be bigger? It can't have more heat, okay? Heat is a means of transferring energy, but it's higher temperature, okay? And higher temperature, as you probably mostly will know, means that the particles, or the, the mean speed of the particles is higher. The particles are moving faster, okay? It's a little bit more complicated. We're not going, going to go into the definition of temperature. It's relatively complex. But this is how it works, okay? So there is a correlation between temperature and the speed of particles, okay? So as you say correctly, U1 is going to be higher. The particles have higher kinetic energy, therefore the sum is going to be higher. All right, what will happen? The energy might be transferred through heat. Sorry? The energy might be transferred through heat. Okay, so there will be some transfer of energy as heat, and which way will it go? Okay, so you go from this block to this block, okay? Q, heat, energy as heat will be transferred. Disorder, there's no work concern, okay? It's just disordered transfer of energy. All right, well, often people think that the reason why this transfer of energy will occur is that there is more energy here and therefore the energy content will try to equalize this is not correct, okay? This is not true. Why is it not true? Well, imagine that the bottom bit of aluminum is no longer 10 by 20 by 20 centimeters, but it's actually one kilometer by one kilometer by whatever, okay, half a kilometer or something, okay? So it's massive. What will the internal energies be like? Which is going to be bigger in this case? Indeed. Now U2 is going to be bigger, significantly bigger. Because even though the particles here are moving a little bit slower than the, uh, than the ones in the top one, there are just so many more particles in the bottom chunk of aluminum that when we sum all the energies together, the internal energy is gonna be massively bigger. Yeah? Now, which way will the energy flow as heat? The same way, okay? It's going to flow exactly the same way. So what tells us which way and how energy is going to be transferred is not the energy content in the system or the part of the system, okay? That just tells us that there is some energy that can be transferred, but it doesn't really tell us which way this energy will be transferred, all right? Now, there could be several different answers to why this is, why in this specific example this happens, okay? But I'm using this as an illustration for another concept in thermodynamics, which is a little bit, well, 
a little bit more opaque, a little bit more difficult to understand, but hopefully we'll get to understand it at least to some extent than energy. And this is called entropy. Entropy. Sorry? The amount of chaos. Well, well, we'll I'll, I'll talk about the different ways of how we can look at, at entropy. We'll talk about entropy in the second half of the lecture. Okay, we'll take a break before then. But before we take a break, I want to define another parameter which we'll need later on, okay? Um, which is actually derived from internal energy, okay? And you probably, well, some of you will have heard its name, but it's important to understand why it exists. Now, uh, chemists and thermodynamicists, they are studying real life reactions, okay? Well, sometimes they're studying some abstract models, but oftentimes they are interested in real life reactions. So imagine that uh, you have a bit of petrol or whatever, diesel, what have you, and you just burn it, okay, on the bench in a little beaker or something, okay, you burn it. And you're interested in finding out how much energy as heat you can get out of it, okay? Because you want to use it to heat something or whatever, okay? Now, you could basically look at or calculate the change in internal energy. But there is a problem because the internal energy can change both by giving off heat, but also by doing some work. Now, in this example that I just described to you, so a bit of petrol is burning in a beaker, you don't immediately see the work that is being done. But in fact, there is. Because as the, as, the, um, as the petrol is burning and creating carbon dioxide and water vapor and whatever, these gases that are formed, they need to expand. They need to get bigger because they are really hot. And in order to expand, they actually have to push against the atmosphere because the atmosphere has some pressure, right? There's air all around us and the air is pushing basically the gases back. So it's the same way as if you had a cylinder and a piston, okay? And the gases were pushing on a piston. So they're actually doing work on the atmosphere, okay? By expanding. Do you agree? Good. The trouble is it's virtually impossible to calculate, to measure this work. Okay? It's really hard, okay? Because you don't you, you would have to think about atmospheric pressure and temperatures. It's really, really hard to figure out how much this work is. So thermodynamicists actually used a trick. And they defined a new parameter which neglects, which makes away with this work. I'll explain. This new parameter is called enthalpy. It's denoted as H. Enthalpy. Do, please do not mix it up with entropy. It's a very different thing, and we're going to be talking about it in the second hour of the lecture. So enthalpy. Now, enthalpy is defined as internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume of the system. This does not have any physical interpretation, okay? It's, it's just a mathematical trick, okay? You can't say, because for internal energy, we said, well, it's just the sum of all the energies. That makes sense, okay? We can see what it is. For enthalpy, it's, it just can't be described, okay? It's, it's just a mathematical expression. But this mathematical expression has a, some really, really good property, and that is, the delta H at a constant pressure, that's sort of important, but not important for you, is equal to Q. It does away with this work bit, okay? I could show you how it's derived. It's basically this P times V that 
cancels out okay, when, when we see the change. I don't really want to go too much into that. If you're interested, it's very easy to find in textbooks of thermodynamics. Okay? So it cancels out this work. And when we look at this petrol burning in a beaker, by calculating enthalpy changes, we can completely disregard the work that is done. And it just basically gives us the amount of heat, and that's what we were interested in. Does this make sense? Even if it doesn't, <laughs> we will use it later on to define something much more important, okay? So this is just a preparatory step for us to be able to understand some more important parameter later on, okay? But I just want you to know that this enthalpy definition is just a mathematical trick, okay? It doesn't have any, um, any clear physical interpretation, okay? The enthalpy of a system is just the internal energy plus the, the sum of, of pressure and volume of the system. That's all, okay? But this is important, that delta H at constant pressure, which is what we do, okay? We're, we assume that here it's always constant pressure, okay? It doesn't change with the reaction. With our burning petrol, the atmospheric pressure is the same, okay? So we assume constant pressure, and here the change of enthalpy is equal to the heat which is released. We'll get to that, we'll use this um, in a second. All right, uh, do you have any questions so far about the first law of thermodynamics, about the definition of energy, work heat? Is it all clear-ish? All right, so let's take a five minute break and we're gonna continue with entropy, which is gonna be a little bit more difficult to get your, around, uh, get your head around it. All right, so, in order to talk about uh, this new parameter uh, that, we just, that we just mentioned, which is called entropy, we need to go back to France in the beginning of the 19th century, okay? There, uh, at that time, of course, what, what time is it in European history? Does anyone know what we would call this period? Yeah. Well, industrialization, we actually call it the industri industrial revolution. Okay, so it's industrial revolution, uh, which started in England, in Britain. Okay, so Britain was the first country which really took advantage of the new technologies and the availability of coal, etc., etc. And France, the ever rival of Britain, was looking across the channel and was thinking, okay, well, they have all these new factories and all these new machines and all these new weapons, and we have to make at least as good ones or better ones in order to be able to defeat them in a possible war. And there have been wars between France and England, you know, forever. Um, so a lot of people started looking into how to make better machines, better engines. And what kind of engines we're talking about at that point, we're talking about steam engines, okay? Can somebody describe the principle of a steam engine? Yeah? Water vapor and the turbine. Well, uh, at that point, they really weren't using turbines, although you could use a turbine, but um, it's a little bit more primitive and maybe a little bit more easy to uh, describe, but imagine the basic principle, you could use turbine, of course you could, um, but I think that makes it a little bit harder to, uh, to work out the principle. So imagine you have a cylinder which is full of some gas, okay? In steam engine it would be steam, but it can be any gas, really. So there is gas inside. You heat the gas with a flame or whatever, okay? But at that point it was usually coal or wood fire. So there would, be, uh, there would be fire underneath. And as you heat the gas, what happens? It moves faster, it moves faster correct, and it, it expands, okay? The pressure increases and the gas expands. As it expands, it moves this piston, okay? It moves it, and we can use this movement to do some work, to push something or, you know, to, to move a, a wheel or something like that, right? Now the important thing about the steam engine is that it has to come back to its original uh, state. So the piston pu is pushed out, okay? The gas cools down, okay? Some of the heat is removed from it. And then the piston is pushed back and the whole thing starts again. Okay, it's heated up and, and it basically moves the piston in and out 
and you can do all sorts of things with that. All right? Basic principle of a steam engine. Do you all understand? Yeah? Good. Now, uh, people were thinking about all sorts of ideas how to make it better, how to make the efficiency better. Now, when I say efficiency, does anyone have an idea what I mean by efficiency? Very good. So it's basically the ratio of the energy that I give to the machine and how much work I get out of it. Okay? So that's the efficiency. And of course, you want to get as much work as possible. Ideally, you would convert all the energy that you put in into work. Okay? That would be the ideal machine. Right. So people were trying to figure out how to make more efficient steam engines, and they worked with like higher pressures or some exotic gases and whatever, and they were trying to figure out how to make it better. Now, in France, there was this young engineer called Sadi Carnot who used, instead of just like designing new machines, he used mathematics to try to figure out. Uh, Sadi Carnot. And he used mathematics, and he basically was the first one, or among the first ones, to make a mathematical model of a steam engine. So he imagined an ideal steam engine and just started describing it mathematically. Okay? Now, for anyone who's interested, it's very easy to find the model, and actually nowadays it's sort of high school physics, so it's relatively easy to understand the model. I'm not going to go in, into the details of that, but if you're interested, it's, it's relatively easy to understand how it works. What he found out when he made this model, he found out that, well, let me, let me first describe the model and then it's going to be clear what he found. So basically what he said was, we have, in any steam engine, we have, first we have a source of heat, okay? So we have a reservoir of temperature T1, which is high, something hot, okay? In this case, it would be a flame, but it could be anything really. From the reservoir with temperature T1, some energy as heat, Q1, is transferred to the engine, okay? This engine, does some work, and some of the heat is transferred to a cold reservoir with, with lower temperature T2. Okay? So this was the, kind, the general model that, it, that he made. All right? Now, in the case of a classical steam engine, this colder reservoir is generally the atmosphere or in case of a ship, it would be the ocean. Okay, so that's where most of the heat was flowing out. And actually for most of, well, for a large part of the 19th century, most people had no idea that you actually needed this cold thing. And we'll get to some of the uh, scientists that actually figure out that you absolutely need it, that it's not an optional thing, okay? All right, so what he found by the analysis, by the mathematical analysis of this model, of basically gas expanding and, and transferring heat and work, he found that for any cyclically, so continuously working machine, Q1 over T1 must be equal to Q2 over T2. That's what he found out, okay? It doesn't look that surprising, but it does have some very surprising implications. The first one was, Using this and just rearranging this formula for efficiency, I'm not going to derive that. It's relatively simple, but we don't have to do that. He found out that the only parameter that determines the efficiency of this machine is the ratio of the two temperatures. So it doesn't matter what kind of gas you use. It doesn't matter what kind of pressures you use. It really depends on just on that, how far apart the hot reservoir is from the cold reservoir. That's the only thing that matters, okay? And there was a relatively big breakthrough because it, it showed all the other people that they should be focusing on other things, all right? Now, Sadi Carnot, he died very young. I think he died when he was 26 or something like that. And a lot of his writings became unknown, okay? Lots of, basically not a lot of people read them. 
But later on, about a generation or two later, 30 or 40 years later, two other very important scientists started working with this kind of model. They rediscovered this model and started looking at very similar kinds of machines. They no longer call them steam engines because we're much, much later in the century, but they call them very generally as heat engines. Because any kind of engine that uses heat to do work is called a heat engine, okay? And it's a much more general description, okay? So for example, a refrigerator is a heat engine, which works the other way around, but it's also a heat engine, and it, it follows the same principles, okay? So these two guys, 30 or 40 years later after Sadi Carnot's death, um, where Lord Kelvin in the United Kingdom and Rudolf Clausius in Germany. So these two guys started looking at the same model. And what caught their attention was exactly this thing among other things. Uh, they, they were wondering, well, how is it possible? Why is it that in this cyclical working of this machine, some quantity, which is Q over T, is conserved? It's the same all the time, okay? So basically, the, the engine goes in a circle, and when it comes back, Q over T is the same, okay? You can imagine that if, if we move this to the other side, it's gonna be Q1 over T1 minus Q2 over T2 is equal to zero. So the change in Q over T is zero, okay? And they were wondering, well, maybe this is telling us something interesting. And Rudolf Clausius used this to define a new entity, new quantity, new physical quantity called entropy, which is denoted as S, okay? And he said that delta S is equal to Q over T. Or in other words, the change in entropy of a system is equal to the heat the system receives, or the energy the system receives as heat, divided by the temperature of the system. As you can see, he just defined it from this mathematical model, okay? It's unlike energy, which we can sort of understand, he, he was just looking at this very general model and said, something is conserved, and this thing that is conserved is probably very important for all sorts of other purposes, okay? So he just took it and defined it in such a way, all right? So this was entropy. And both Kelvin, who actually came to a similar conclusion coming from using a slightly different terminology and slightly different uh, way of thinking, they generalized their findings from the heat engine into another law of thermodynamics, which is called the second law of thermodynamics, okay? What is the second law? Well, there are at least three possible formulations of the second law, which are all equivalent. They all say the same thing, even though they sound very different. So, the easiest one is the one from Rudolf Clausius, and he defined the second law, he described the second law of thermodynamics as saying that it is impossible for heat to spontaneously transfer from a colder object to a hotter object. Okay? So spontaneously, and we had this picture here with the aluminum chunks, okay? So we all intuitively know that, but he described it also using the mathematical analysis as the second law of thermodynamics. So from a colder object to a warmer object, heat will never transfer spontaneously. Now what does it mean spontaneously? Well, in everyday language it just means that basically it happens, all right? You don't have to do anything to it. In thermodynamics it means that you don't have to use any work, okay? It just happens. So we can, of course, take heat from a colder object and transfer it to a warmer object. This is what refrigerators do, right? So we can do that. But in order to do that, we have to do some work. We have to put it you know, in electricity or something. So we have to add some work. But spontaneously, if we just leave it to itself, it will only go from the hotter object to the colder object, 
Okay, so that's Clausius's uh, formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, Lord Kelvin formulated it quite differently. He still used this model of a heat engine, and he formulated the second law of thermodynamics by saying that it is impossible to make an engine which converts all the heat into work. Okay? And this is when I said that people didn't realize that this cold reservoir is important, but it is. Without it, without basically dumping some of the energy as heat, useless heat, into the cold reservoir, the machine would not be able to work. This is important because it basically says that whenever work is done, some of the energy that you are transferring has to be transferred uselessly as heat. Okay? It is impossible to have anything in nature that will take heat and completely transfer it into useful work. Always some of the heat has to be wasted out, okay? which is just a different formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. The third formulation, and that's the one that you often find in textbooks, is that for any isolated system, so a system which does not exchange anything with the surroundings, the change in entropy over time has to be higher than zero or at least equal to zero. In other words, in an isolated system, the entropy of an isolated system cannot go down. It cannot de decrease. Okay? It can either stay the same or it has to go up. These three formulations of the second law of thermodynamics that I just said, so heat cannot spontaneously flow from a colder object to a hotter object, no machine can be constructed which would completely turn heat into work, and the entropy of an isolated system has to at least remain the same or increase, it cannot go down, are equivalent. We, can, we could use the mathematics and show that they are basically the same thing, okay, even though they sound very different. So as you can see, the second law of thermodynamics really describes some very fundamental things about the universe. Okay? It tells us how it is possible to do any work. Well, work can only be done if an appropriate amount of energy is wasted. Okay? If no energy is wasted, no work is going to be done. Good. This formulation here is valid for the whole universe. Because the universe, we assume that the universe is an isolated system, that there are no other universes that we can communicate with. Okay? Maybe there are, but let's assume that the, uh, that the universe is an isolated system. Therefore, the entropy of the universe has to increase. Now, I'll just briefly address this equality here, okay? that it can stay the same. This applies only to very specific and very abstract and basically non-existent processes, which are called reversible processes. Now, reversible in everyday language means that you can just put it back. Okay? I dropped the chalk and I can just take it back and that was reversible. But that's not what rever reversible means in thermodynamics. Okay? In thermodynamics, reversible means that at any point in the process, if you change the parameters by an infinitely small amount, the process is reversed. So, a little illustration. Imagine that I have a cylinder with gas and a little piston here. Okay? What I could do in order to you know, increase the volume of the gas, I'll just pull on the, on the piston and the gas will have more space to expand into. All right? This, from a thermodynamic point of view, is not a reversible process. In order to make it reversible, I would have to move it first just by infinitely small amount, let the gas expand a little bit, and then by another infinitely small amount and let the gas expand a little bit, and then by another, 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 okay? So this is a very specific, abstract kind of process why, is it, why do we talk about it? Because it's very easy to calculate. It's very easy to do mathematics with reversible processes. It's very difficult to do it with irreversible processes. However, in the universe, in nature, in our bodies, all the processes, or virtually all the processes, are irreversible. So this equality here, 
entropy stays the same is only true for re reversible processes. But since we know that basically all the processes are irreversible, the entropy of the universe has to keep increasing, okay? according to the second law of thermodynamics. Now, yes? Say again? It's, it's a very abstract concept that basically cannot really easily occur in nature. Okay? Theoretically, yeah, maybe in some you know, black hole or something, but um, it's, most of our biochemistry and physiology does not occur with, with reversible processes. However, often we assume that the processes are reversible because it's so much easier to calculate, it's so much easier to work with. Okay? But in fact, they are not. Okay, and, and a lot, that's why a lot of the descriptions of energy transfers in our cells are incorrect because we assume that they are reversible, but they're not really, all right? Good. What, do you, what scale do you mean? Because obviously every system is always losing energy because, because okay? I would probably disagree with that, but. No, but <laughs> when you say reversible, you either mean a state like you said, I can make water, uh, I can freeze them, then will, they will be iced, then I can heat them, and yep. they will be uh, liquid again. Yep. This is a type of reversibility. Yeah, but not the time that I'm talking about. So you're talking about also the heat that is uselessly being extracted? No. For the reversibility, I'm just talking about this abstract concept of a process which doesn't really occur, where at any point, if you just change the parameters by infinitely small amount, the process goes back, okay? So when I heat or freeze water, that's never reversible from this, in this sense, because what I do is I change, like I, I put the, the water that has temperature, whatever, 20 degrees, and I put it in a refrigerator that is minus 20 degrees, okay? So I'm not changing the temperature by infinitely small amounts and waiting for the, uh, for the water to change its temperature. I just put it in and there's a massive difference of temperatures and it freezes. It's not a reversible process from this point of view, okay? It's reversible in a way that yes, I can then melt it, okay, sure. But thermodynamically, this is not a reversible process, okay? And when you said that each system is losing energy, well, no, certainly not. I mean, there are lots of systems that just absorb energy, like, for example, the Earth, okay? It's absorbing energy from the sun, for example, okay? So, it's, I, don't, I don't think that, that is true. But anyway, I don't want to complicate things too much. Now, this concept, why am I talking about this concept of entropy? Why is it so important? Because it tells us, the change in entropy of the universe tells us what will spontaneously occur and what will not spontaneously occur, okay? Because only processes that increase the entropy of the universe will occur, okay? And if we're looking at a little system in which the entropy would decrease by the process, then we have to have another system next to it whose entropy or the entropy of the rest of the universe increases more than the bit that decreased in our system. And I'll explain that using human cells. So for example, in our nucleus, we want to build DNA, a molecule of DNA, okay? Building a molecule of DNA, and I'm not gonna explain why, but decreases the entropy of the nucleus, okay? Because it's a highly ordered structure, and, and we're actually locally, we're decreasing entropy. Now this would be impossible, according to the second law of thermodynamics, unless in doing so, we increase the entropy of the rest of the universe by a higher value than we decreased it locally. So in sum, the whole universe, the entropy increases. <coughs> All right? So in any process that we see happening, either it increases entropy of the universe directly, and we see that, or if it appears to decrease it, then it will not happen spontaneously. We have to have another process that will power it by increasing the entropy of the universe by a higher value than it decreases. Okay, I can see that some of you are already giving up. Uh, yes? Is it because it's a difference between two entropies, not by one entropy state? No, 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 no. The whole universe has some entropy, okay? All the sums of all the entropies of all the systems in the universe put together is the entropy of the universe. According to the second law of thermodynamics, this entropy has to keep increasing, or at least stay the same, but we said that that doesn't really happen very much. It has to keep increasing, 
So whatever happens has to increase the entropy of the universe. Whatever happens, or it doesn't happen. Now, we can imagine a little system, a little test tube, where the entropy, where there's a process where the entropy decreases locally. But in order for this process to happen, we have to have another process which increases the entropy of the surroundings by more than the entropy that decreased in the, uh, in the test tube. So that the whole universe, the entropy of the whole universe still increases. Okay, so it's impossible basically to do anything which would decrease entropy for the whole universe. It just can't happen. It can happen locally, but then it must be paid for by increasing the entropy of the, of the universe by more. It's actually just a reformulation of what we just said here. If we're doing any work, some of the energy that we're putting into the work has to be wasted. We have to put it out. And this waste heat increases the entropy of the universe, which I'll show you in a second in using math, a bit of mathematics. All right? We'll, we'll see that in a second. Good. So, these are very abstract, very complex ideas, whatever entropy, and entropy of the universe obviously is the most abstract thing that you can imagine. And your obvious question would be, well, if we can only decide if something will happen or not by measuring the change in entropy of the whole universe, well, how can we do that? How can we possibly measure the changes of entropy of the whole universe, right? We, don't, we can't even see the whole universe. How can we measure the entropy of it? Well, here come again thermodynamicists who are very clever and who figured out a trick. And they figured out a trick how we can measure the change in entropy of the universe by only looking at changes of our system. So we're only going to be measuring stuff that's happening in our test tube, and that will tell us about the entropy of the whole universe. And this very clever parameter is called the Gibbs energy. Gibbs energy. Does anyone know what Gibbs energy, how it's defined? Okay, so the change in Gibbs energy is telling us whether a process is going to be spontaneous or not, because it's telling us something about the entropy of the universe, okay? But does anyone know how it's mathematically defined? It has something to do with potentials. Yeah? Okay, this is the definition of Gibbs energy. Okay, so it's a Gibbs energy of a system is equal to the enthalpy of the system. And remember, we defined enthalpy before. Okay, so we know what enthalpy is, sort of, at least. Okay, so it's the enthalpy of a system minus the product of temperature of the system times the entropy of the system. Once again, this is just a definition, okay? This is just a definition, just a, just a trick, okay? The same way as enthalpy is a bit of a trick that makes things easier for us, Gibbs energy is also a trick. And as you'll see, the changes in Gibbs energy not only tell us if something is going to be spontaneous, but they tell us about the changes of the entropy of the universe. How does that work? Well, delta G, so change in Gibbs energy, is equal to delta H minus T delta S of the system. Now, this, for those, for those of you who are advanced thermodynamicists and physicists, this is only true at constant temperature, okay? If the temperature changes in the process, we would have to use a slightly more complicated mathematical description, okay? But let's not worry about it. It's, let's assume that the temperature is constant, which it mostly is, okay? If we're looking at processes, for example, in our body, we just assume that the temperature is whatever, 37 degrees Celsius or something like that, okay? Now, of course, this temperature is in Kelvin. It's the thermodynamic temperature, but it doesn't really matter very much. All right, so delta G, this thing that tells us whether a process is going to be spontaneous is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. 
Now, what is delta H of the system equal to? Not change in heat. It's equal to heat that the system absorbed. Okay? We defined it here. Okay, the delta H is equal to the heat that the system absorbed. So, it's equal to Q minus T delta S system. All right? Now, here I'm going to do another trick which sometimes is a little confusing. So, do pay attention. It's not difficult, but it can be confusing. So delta H Q is the heat that the system absorbed, okay? But now I am interested in the heat that the system released. What do I have to do with this equation in order to get the heat that the system released to the surroundings? Standard. Sorry? Standard. Very good. I'm gonna put minus there. It's still the same heat. But instead of looking at what the system absorbed, I'm looking at what the system released. I'm just gonna put minus there, and that's it. Okay, did you follow that? It's still the same heat. I didn't do anything illegal, okay? I just started looking at it from a different point of view. Not what the system absorbed, but what the system released to the surroundings. Good. Now, Can we use this formula to help us get one step further? Mm, mm. Can we express Q in terms of this equation? Okay. But this time, what S is this S? What entropy is this entropy? Of the, of the surroundings. Okay, because we're looking at the heat which is released to the surroundings. So the heat which is released will change the entropy of the surroundings by this much, by T delta S, okay? Or the heat, all right? So this is surroundings minus T delta S system. Okay, we assume that the temperature is constant, okay? Again, if it wasn't constant, we would have to use a little bit of uh, integrals and stuff. So far, do you follow? Can you explain just again Gibbs? Gibbs energy is defined as enthalpy minus T times S. That's what it is, okay? <laughs> But the change in Gibbs energy is telling us, first of all, whether a process is gonna spontaneously happen or not, okay? And it's also telling us how much work we can get out of the system, but we'll, I'll, I'll get to that, okay? But the definition is just mathematics, it's just mathematics, it's a trick, okay? But a trick that tells us something interesting. Yes? No, 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 no. I'm just changing the Q, okay? The, the minus T delta S is from the, from the definition of Gibbs energy, but the Q, as I said, is defined here as the Q as the heat which the system absorbs. But I'm interested in how much is released, which is just changing the sign. It's still the same heat, okay? I'm just, so if the system absorbs something, it's a plus heat, okay? If it releases, it's minus. That's, that's all I'm doing, okay? Yes? Because from the definition here, it should be the Q, the heat, which is absorbed. Okay? So, the, the definition is the heat that is absorbed. So, let's assume that five joules was absorbed. Okay? How much was released? If five joules was absorbed, how much was released? No, not really. I have a test tube and I edit five joules of energy as heat to it, temperature increased, whatever. How much of the heat was released? 
minus 5 joules. I know it doesn't make sense. How can you release minus 5 joules? But in mathematics, you can work with that. Okay? So when I add 5 joules to something, I took away minus 5 joules of something. You disagree. But that, or does it make sense? Yeah. That's all I'm doing. It's just playing with maths. Okay? I can do that. It doesn't make sense that I edit 5 joules or that I removed minus 5 joules or something. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I can do this in mathematics. Okay? Because it's equivalent. Okay? Adding 5 joules or removing minus 5 joules is the same thing. So that's what I did here. So now we define the delta S as the surrounding. Correct. And the minus still It must be there. Because if it wasn't there, then this S would be the S of the system. Because I'm looking in the system, but I want to be looking outside of the system, that's where I have to put minus there. Yeah? Yes? And in the equation, we did always like the delta S, we assume like for surrounding, or we don't get it? Well, uh, so from the definition, this S has to be the S of the system. That's the definition of it, okay? Here, if I didn't put the minus there, it would be the heat which was absorbed by the system, and the heat which was absorbed by the system changes the entropy of the system, naturally. So if the minus was not here, here would be also the system. But that doesn't help us very much. We're interested in the change in the surroundings. So I put a minus here, and I change the heat which was absorbed to the heat which was released, and in that case, the heat which is released is changing the S of the surroundings, right? Because it was released. So by just changing the sign here, instead of a system, I can have surroundings here. Just a trick, but a very useful one. All right? So if we put these two together, we get the delta G is equal to minus T delta S of the universe. Because there's nothing else. There's system and surroundings, and that's it. If you put it together, it's the universe, right? In other words, if Gibbs energy of a system is decreasing, the entropy of the universe is increasing. Therefore, processes in which Gibbs energy goes down are going to be spontaneous because the entropy of the universe is going up, which is what we like because it follows the second law of thermodynamics. On the other hand, processes where Gibbs energy goes up will not spontaneously happen because it would mean that the entropy of the universe is going down, which is not possible. Okay? And therefore, we have to have another process next to it which is spontaneous, which increases the entropy of the universe more in order to power this other process which would normally decrease it. And this is exactly what we do in our cells, what we do with ATP, right? The hydrolysis of ATP, and we're going to be talking about that more later, the hydrolysis of ATP is a process which decreases the Gibbs energy of a system quite significantly. Therefore, we can add to it a process which would normally increase Gibbs energy, but if we put them together, overall, Gibbs energy is going to go down, and this is what we like. Hmm? Spontaneous. Yeah, then the two processes together will be spontaneous. Okay? Separately, one of them would be, but the other one wouldn't. But we can add them together, and then they will be spontaneous because they work, okay? because Gibbs energy is going to go down of the system. All right. Raise your hand if you understand this, or at least, you know, as much as you can. Because <laughs> I'm leaving a little bit. Okay, all right. Because um, I'm leaving a lot of the mathematics behind it out, because we wouldn't have time for it. It's not very difficult, but I'm trying to mostly give you an idea of how these things fit together, okay? If you're really interested in the mathematics, it's very easy to find on the internet, in textbooks, and it's relatively simple. Okay? It's more about figuring out what is surroundings and what is the system, and that's what I try to make, make clear now. All right. The last bit, uh, in the last bit, we're going to basically apply Gibbs energy to actual chemical reactions. What it actually tells us, what it actually, yeah, tells us. 
Uh, all right. So, here is a graph of Gibbs energy of a system where there is a chemical reaction occurring. And the chemical reaction is, for example, A plus B turns to C plus D. Okay? Some chemical reaction. And we're interested in how Gibbs energy changes throughout this process. So in the beginning, here, we have pure A plus B. At the end, sort of, we have pure C plus D. And then, in between, we have various proportions of A plus B and C plus D. This makes sense, what I just did here, okay? The x-axis describes what we call the extent of reaction, how far the reaction has proceeded, okay? The extent of reaction. Is, is this clear? Because if it isn't, you won't understand the rest of it, so. It doesn't mean time, no, 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 no. It means the composition of the reaction mixture, okay? It, it, it's not time. Yeah, okay. So the y-axis is Gibbs energy, that's relatively simple, but the x-axis is how far the reaction has proceeded from the pure reactants to the pure products, okay? So here at the end we have pure reactants, here we have pure products, and everywhere in the middle we have a different ratio of products to reactants as, as the, the reaction proceeds, okay? It's not time, okay? We kind of s stop the time at each point and we look at what the, um, what the Gibbs energy is. Is it clear? Again, if you don't understand this, it will be impossible to understand the rest of it, so, yeah? How far from the products, uh, from the reactants to the products? So we start with pure reactants, pure A plus B. It's not time, it's, it's not. It does happen in time, but we don't know how fast. It, if it's linear, we, we don't know that. That's not important. How many molecules of A plus B? as opposed to how many molecules of C plus D we have. That's what the x-axis describes, okay? So here it's pure A plus B, here it's pure C plus D, and in the middle it's all sorts of proportions, okay? So here A plus B is going to be decreasing, and C plus D is going to be gradually increasing, yeah? All right, okay. So generally, the curve of Gibbs energy in this case will look something like this. So it will be maximum with pure reactants, but it will also be maximum with pure, and when I say pure, I mean only products. Not even one molecule, actually it will be infinite. If you calculate it, it will be infinite, okay? But let's not worry about that, yeah? This is G, not delta G. This is G, this is G, okay? So we start at, at very, very high G, we end, but we don't end there, actually, as you'll see in a second, and also at a very high end, a very high G. And as you see, because delta G, we know that delta G for a spontaneous process has to be negative. So at any point where you are, the reaction will try to minimize the value of G. Okay? For any system spontaneously, if, if things start to happen spontaneously, it will try to get to the lowest amount of G. Why? Well, well, we'll get to equilibrium, but why is, it, why is it that any system will try to minimize its... But why? What about entropy? The entropy of a universe is just inverse of that, right? So, so any system will try to maximize its entropy. That's the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So it's the same thing with Gibbs energy, okay? It's only turned around because there's a negative sign there. Yeah? Good, so any system will try to get to the lowest point of Gibbs energy. And this is where the reaction stops. This is where no more change from products to reactants overall will occur. And this is called the equilibrium. 
okay? The equilibrium. An equilibrium is basically just a place where the change in Gibbs energy is equal to zero. Okay, there, Gibbs energy cannot change anymore because it's at the lowest state. If it were to change, it would have to go in the wrong direction. It would have to go in the non-spontaneous, okay? So that's why everything will go down to the lowest point in Gibbs energy, no matter what, where you start. If you start with A plus B, it's gonna head towards C plus D and stop here. If you're gonna start with pure C plus D, it's gonna head in the opposite direction and it will stop here. Yes? The change in Gibbs energy here is going to be zero. Well, it's obvious, okay? So you start here with G1, and you start here with G2, the delta G is minus something, okay? Yeah, you're subtracting this from that basically, and it's gonna be minus something. It's the same thing here if you're going in this direction, okay? But here, basically, there is no change in Gibbs energy, okay? It's stable there. Now, I don't want to scare you, but we should be really using a differential here, a derivative of the curve. With delta, it's a little bit difficult to imagine, okay? But those of you who know or have seen derivatives, when we take the derivative of the curve here, it's going to be zero, which means that no Gibbs energy. What did you write there? You Sorry? Okay, so it's the differential of the curve. Okay, those of you who don't know differentials, don't worry about it, okay? Basically the change of Gibbs energy is zero there. Why do I put so much emphasis on that? The change in Gibbs energy, apart from telling us about the change of entropy in the universe, it's also telling us how much work the system can perform. Okay? It's actually the maximum, maximum amount of work that the system can perform. Okay? That's part of the definition because here you can imagine that there is the energy bit that we have available and this is the heat that we have to dis discard. Okay? Remember in the heat engine some of the heat has to be discarded? Sort of? Anyway, I'll repeat that again, the important point. The change in Gibbs energy gives us the maximum work that the system can perform. What is the maximum work that the system can perform at equilibrium? Zero. And a system which is at equilibrium cannot perform any work. In other words, let me just finish that. In other words, the only parameter which describes the amount of work a system can perform, for example, in our cells, is how far from equilibrium it is. The further away from equilibrium you are, the more work you can do. And that's the only determinant whether we can do work or whether a system can perform work. Okay? You had a question? So, under ideal conditions, super ideal conditions, no problem, delta G will be equal to the amount of work that the system can do. But we never have ideal conditions. So usually the amount of work that you can actually do is lower than delta G. That's why I say it's the maximum amount of work, okay? But usually it's less that you, that you can, under real conditions that you can get out of that. Now, this, and that's gonna be the last point that I'm gonna say, becomes very important in this concept of macroergic compounds. And you've probably heard of this thing. Have you, who's heard macroergic compounds? You haven't, all right. Okay, uh, good, that's good, because you don't have wrong conception of that. Uh, macroergic compound Now, I'm sure there are some Greek speakers here. Um, what does macroergic mean? So where does it come from? Macro means big, egos, work. Good, so those are compounds that can give us a lot of work. Okay, they can provide work, basically. That's what the name suggests. 
And among these compounds, we usually name things like ATP, uh, creatine phosphate, we're going to be talking about creatine phosphate, GTP, some of the like acetyl-CoA and all these things are called macroergic compounds. What you usually find, and this is very important, so, and this is the last bit of important information, so please do pay attention. What you often find in textbooks is that they explain why these compounds can provide work by saying, well, they have this special bonds in them and this special structure and some resonances and all sorts of stuff like that. That is not true, okay? What gives these compounds ability to power other processes to do work is that they are kept far away from the equilibrium. So our cells are constantly working, and we'll talk in this course what processes they actually do, to keep, for example, the ATP to ADP ratio very far away from the equilibrium. And this is what, a what makes ATP capable of powering other processes. It's not the ATP molecule itself. If we had an equilibrium mixture of ATP and ADP, it couldn't do any work at all. It's still the same ATP, but it couldn't power anything because it's at equilibrium, okay? So the only thing that makes a macroergic compound macroergic, now I'm not saying that there aren't some special bonds in ATP. Yes, they are, and it's interesting chemically. But the only thing that determines its ability to power other processes is how far away from the equilibrium it is, okay? So in fact, in our cells, the ability of ATP to power other things depends on the ATP to ADP ratio, okay? So for example, when the cell is incapable of, of producing enough ATP, the ATP to ADP ratio will decrease and therefore less work will be able to be done in the... So it's not just about the ATP, it's really about the ATP ADP ratio or in other words, how far away from the equilibrium it is. Good. That's all for today. I know it's a lot of stuff to maybe get into your head and to understand. Hopefully this is at least the first step of understanding how these things fit together. If you have any questions, either ask now, or you can ask on Vyuka, or indeed your teachers, or me, or whatever. All right? And we'll continue in this course, and we'll go deeper and deeper into details of what actually goes on in ourselves. All right? Okay. <laughs>